when the clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading it loud and clear. Roger all, Discovery. Discovery, Roger, no problem. Well, thank you, Andrew, and welcome to the February 13, 2019 edition of Space News. This is Peter Ailed, and tonight I have Michael Abdullah, and for the first time, we welcome Tina Stagg from the Space Association. Welcome to the gang, Tina. Well, once again, we're going to start with more space news from Australia. We're going to head up north. Equatorial Launch Australia has secured a US commercial contract to support the development of the local launch industry. The fledgling Australian launch services provider, ELA, announced last week the company's first US-based commercial customer, Tricep Corporation. The partnership will establish an efficient orbital launch and recovery location in Australia for the fast-growing global commercial satellite and rocket launch market. The agreement between ELA and Tricep will provide their commercial customers with access to one of the most exciting and efficient new launch sites in the world. Located just 12 degrees from the equator, ELA's Arnhem Space Centre in northern Australia is a growing site leveraging the extra rotational velocity imparted when launching near the equator. This proximity is an attractive selling point for international spacecraft and satellite manufacturers who are looking for a launch site facilitating rapid, reliable and cost-effective access to low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit and deep space missions. Launches for customers are expected to commence from the Arnhem Space Centre from 2019 this year. With increasing complex missions planned while the site continues to be developed in alignment with customer demand. ELA's Arnhem Space Centre will be Australia's first commercial spaceport, with their capacity to launch and recover orbital space flights that service the growing local and international satellite market. In September last year, the Arnhem Land Aboriginal Land Trust granted a 40-year lease over 275 hectares of land in northeast Arnhem Land for use by ELA as a commercial rocket launching facility. Man, that's exciting. Let's get up there and watch a few rockets blast off. And over to Tina. Thanks, Peter, and good evening, space fans. In NASA news, NASA announced during the week another set of delays for commercial crew program test flights. The agency said SpaceX's uncrewed test flight, previously scheduled for no earlier than February 23, is now no earlier than March 2. And Boeing's uncrewed test flight has also slipped from March to April. NASA said the revised schedules allow for more time for hardware testing, training and reviews. Crewed test flights of SpaceX's Crew Dragon and Boeing's CST-100 Starliner remain, for now, scheduled for this northern summer. The full schedule of commercial crew planning dates are now as follows. SpaceX's Demo-1 flight will be March 2. Boeing's orbital flight test, also uncrewed, will be no earlier than April. Boeing's pad abort test should be May. SpaceX's in-flight abort test, hopefully June. SpaceX's Demo-2 flight, which is crewed, in July. And Boeing's crew flight test, uh, hopefully in August. Turning to the space launch system, the first launch of the SLS could be slipping again. NASA is currently planning for a June 2020 launch of the SLS on Exploration Mission 1, but some sources believe that launch could be delayed until 2021. Delays in testing compounded by the government shutdown, are expected to push back the launch. However, a NASA spokesperson said last week that while NASA was still assessing the effects of the shutdown on the program, it was still working towards a launch in 2020. The partial government shutdown has also delayed a test of the Orion launch abort system. The Ascent Abort 2, or AA2 test, which was scheduled for April, will slip by some periods of time, but less than the 25-day length of the shutdown itself said NASA's Orion program manager. AA2 will perform an in-flight test of Orion's launch abort system by launching a boilerplate Orion capsule on a solid rocket motor from Cape Canaveral. The launch abort system will activate at an altitude of nearly 10,000 metres, testing its ability to pull an Orion spacecraft away from its rocket in an emergency. 
Meanwhile, the shutdown won't affect upcoming environmental testing of the Orion spacecraft. The Orion flying on the first SLS launch is due to arrive at the Plum Brook facility in Ohio this northern summer for environmental testing. NASA says the Orion spacecraft is still scheduled to go to Plum Brook in July, but the schedules across the agency are still being reviewed and may yet be adjusted. And of course it might all be adjusted when they have another shutdown if Trump doesn't get his wall, so who knows what will happen. <laughs> Mike? Okay, let's look at NASA planetary and space science missions. The two CubeSats that flew to Mars with NASA's InSight lander have likely reached the end of their missions. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory said last week that neither of the Mars Cube 1 or Marco CubeSats has contacted the Earth in more than a month. The CubeSats served as data relays during InSight's landing on Mars in November and continued to operate for weeks after they flew past Mars, providing data on the performance of their subsystems. Marco demonstrated for the first time the ability of CubeSats to perform deep space missions. Meanwhile, United Launch Alliance has won a contract recently to launch a NASA planetary science mission. NASA selected ULA's Atlas V to launch the Lucy mission to study a group of asteroids called Trojans in the same orbit around the Sun as Jupiter. That mission will launch in October 2021, with a total launch cost to NASA of $148.3 million. Both ULA and NASA said that the contract was awarded as part of a competitive procurement, but NASA declined to say who else bid on the launch contract. Does that seem unusually cheap for a NASA-ULA contract? (laughs) I wonder if SpaceX is having an impact on some of these prices. They think they might have. Tina? ESA's first Mars rover has been named after a British scientist. ESA announced last week that the rover flying the ExoMars 2020 lander mission will be named Rosalind Franklin after the scientist whose X-ray crystallography work took the first images of the now iconic double helix shape of DNA. The name was the outcome of a competition with more than 36,000 submissions from the public. A second Iranian orbital launch in less than a month apparently failed last week. Commercial satellite imagery of a launch pad at the Iman Khomeini Space Center, where a Safir rocket was being prepared for launch, now shows an empty pad with burn scars. Analysts believe that a rocket did launch from that pad, but with no announcements from the Iranian government, it appears likely that the launch failed at some point after liftoff. The apparent launch failure comes after a January 15 loss of a Simorg rocket, a failure that the Iranian government did acknowledge at the time. Let's move to Japan. The Japanese space agency JAXA has set a date for the landing of its Hayabusa 2 spacecraft on an asteroid. Project leaders said last week that they will attempt a landing on the asteroid Ryugu on February 22 Australian time. JAXA had pushed back the landing because of difficulties identifying a suitable site on the asteroid's surface, which is rockier than expected. Hayabusa 2 will collect samples from Ryugu for a later return to Earth for a landing in outback Australia. Back to you, Tina. In commercial space news, SpaceX performed the first tests of a flight version of its Raptor engine last week. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk announced on Twitter the test at the company's McGregor, Texas test site. While SpaceX has been testing versions of the engine since 2016, these tests mark the first firing of a flight version of the engine, which uses methane and liquid oxygen propellants and produces up to 440,000 pounds force of thrust. The engine will be used on the Starship Hopper test vehicle being assembled at SpaceX's South Texas launch site near Boca Chica for low-altitude test flights. And in Europe, a new rocket engine has passed a key early review. Ariane Group says the Prometheus engine completed a two-month definition review on February 1 in cooperation with the European Space Agency ESA, the French Space Agency CNS and the German Space Agency DLR. 
that review confirmed the design of the low-cost liquid oxygen and methane engine, which is potentially reusable. Production of two demonstration models of the engine is scheduled to begin in the first half of this year for tests in 2020. All right, let's uh, keep going with the commercial news and let's uh, have a look at Virgin Galactic. The two pilots of Spaceship 2's first flight to the edge of space in December have received their astronaut wing. Mark Borger Stuckey and CJ Stuckel received their commercial astronaut wings from the FAA at a ceremony last week. The two piloted Spaceship 2 on a December flight above the 50 mile or 80 kilometer mark used to award astronaut wings by the US government agencies, although they did not reach the 100 kilometer Kármán line. The commercial astronaut wings are the first awarded since 2004, when Mike Melville and Brian Binney received them for Spaceship One flight. Virgin Galactic also donated the hybrid rocket motor used on that flight to the National Air and Space Museum in a separate ceremony last week. Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson said he expects the next Spaceship 2 suborbital orbital test flight to take place around February 20, and that he expects to fly to space on the first commercial flight in July of this year. Well, maybe he's going to use that to mark the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. All right, finally this week, a move over, Summer of Love. 2019 will be the Summer of Space at the US Public Broadcasting Service. The network says it's planning a celestial programming spectacle this summer tied to the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing, with the centrepiece being the six-hour documentary film Chasing the Moon, scheduled to air in July. Other science and history programs linked to the the anniversary are planned on topics ranging from astronomy to future space exploration. And speaking of which, uh, we at the Space Association have been busy behind the scenes and... uh, All we can say at this stage is stay tuned for announcements for plans and events by and with the Space Association uh, to commemorate the 50th anniversary. Keep uh, track of this radio show, come along to our meetings or uh, send us an email and we'll keep you updated. It's going to be an exciting year. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thank you, Tenny. You've filled in uh, perfectly. Thanks, guys. And we'll talk to you, Andrew.